Hello lovelies, I'm True Crime Caitlin and welcome back to my channel and another True Crime Case. Thank you so much for being here with me. If you're interested in true crime, please make sure to subscribe because that's what this channel is all about. You can also click the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload a brand new true crime case. Before continuing to listen, please check the description box below for my disclaimer and for any content warnings. Today we're going to be talking about another unsolved case that is coming up to 31 years old. Earlier this year, on the 30th anniversary of this case, police launched a fresh appeal with hopes that someone would come forward with information. And so I hope that with today's video, it can start a conversation that will reach the right person who has the key to solving this case. So let's jump straight in. On the 24th of January 1993, just after 7pm, police received a report that a young girl was missing. Gillian Querapel, who just went by Jill, had contacted the police after she'd gone into her seven-year-old daughter Stacey's bedroom and found that her bed was empty and that her coat and shoes were gone. Jill explained that she had sent Stacey to bed early that evening after she had been acting up and they had had an argument. So as punishment, she was sent to bed and this was around 5.30 p.m. Jill explained that she had noticed that Stacey was missing after she'd gone to run herself a bath. Then before getting in, she went to check on Stacey and her younger sister in their bedroom that they shared. And that's when she discovered that Stacey was gone. Initially, Jill wasn't as worried as you might think. Stacey had run away twice before and she had been threatening to run away in the past few days. So it didn't come as a massive shock when she had run away. Jill actually thought Stacey was only doing this because she wanted attention. A search party of police officers with dogs, family, friends and volunteers were all assembled to try and help find Stacey. Bear in mind it's now after 7pm in January so it'll be freezing and it'll be pitch black and little Stacey is terrified of the dark. Shortly after 9pm, a policeman who was walking with a dog along a path in the area of South Hill Park, which is in Bracknell, Berkshire, spots a very petite girl who he believes is Stacey and she's lay in some sort of undergrowth, so he makes a beeline to her. She's wearing a Mickey Mouse t-shirt, a parka, some tracksuit bottoms and some relatively clean shoes. This young girl, who was Stacey, is found laying on her back and she looks so peaceful that this officer initially thinks that she's sleeping so he quietly gently whispers a name to her wanting to wake her up but not to give her a fright but her eyes don't flutter open he tries again and he notices that her chest isn't rising or falling so he tries to find a pulse but he doesn't find one. Paramedics race to the scene and they try their best to resuscitate Stacey. However, their attempts were sadly futile and seven-year-old Stacey Querapel was pronounced dead at Heathwood Hospital. A post-mortem exam concluded that Stacey's death was the result of a terrible accident. They determined that she had died from asphyxia and the theory was that after she was sent to bed, she snuck out of her home on Lady Bank Estate, which was about a five to 10 minute walk away from where she was found. This video shows how close it was. These are the flats that she lived in. She could quite easily go down the street, along the road, and then up onto the grounds of South Hill Park. South Hill Park was somewhere where all the kids on the estate would often play. It had a couple of play parks inside, it had lakes, it had public footpaths for walking and it had lots of trees. There was lots of area in here for kids to play and explore. Looking at the photos, it looks really, really nice. So they believe that Stacey had snuck out of her home shortly after being sent to bed that visibility was low because it was so dark and that while Stacey was playing, her necklace had become tangled in some branches and she couldn't untangle them. So this resulted in her choking to death. However, not everyone was convinced with this theory. Stacey was sent for a second post-mortem exam, which was conducted by the Home Secretary pathologist, Dr. Richard Shepard. Some of you might recognise his name. He's a very well-known pathologist. He's been on TV and he's wrote some pretty good books as well. I would definitely recommend this one if you're looking for your next read. Dr. Shepard found that ligature marks that were discovered on Stacey were more consistent with deliberate ligature strangulation 
Burton saw someone had deliberately strangled Stacey using the necklace as a ligature, not that the necklace had become tangled or caught on a branch. Dr. Shepard also added that it was likely that Stacey wasn't murdered where she was found, that she was murdered somewhere else and then her body was hid in South Hill Park. This was because Stacey herself and her clothes and her shoes were all pretty clean, they were relatively clean, whereas where she was found was very muddy and clarty. There were no marks found on Stacey that indicated that there was any sort of struggle or fight, she had no self-defence wounds. There was also no sign of sexual interference which helped rule out a potential motive. With the results from this second post-mortem, a murder investigation was launched. Police needed to know who their victim was. If they knew more about Stacey, they could try and figure out a motive. Why would someone want to murder an innocent young girl such as Stacey? And by finding this out, it would aid and help finding her killer. So, Stacey Querapel was seven years old and living with her mum, 33-year-old Gillian Querapel, on Ladybank Estate in Bracknell, Berkshire. This was on a council estate which apparently had a lot of violence and crime right on the doorstep and a lot of, quote, rough people live there. That is not me saying that people who live on a council estate are rough. I was brought up on one and I know there's always going to be the odd one or two but everyone else is just regular, normal and fine. Rough was just a word that was used when describing some people who lived here at the time. Someone who was described as a permanent lodger also lived in the flat. Older reports said that this was Jill's new boyfriend, a man named Steve Hartigan who was 25 years old. Stacey did have, I believe, two younger sisters. The girls had different dads and really only one of Stacey's sisters is very briefly mentioned throughout the case. Her name is in older reports however as an adult she wants to remain anonymous so when referring to her throughout the case I'm just going to call her Grace because I think it'll get confusing if I say Stacey and then Stacey's sister especially because like I say I believe that she has two. I'm not sure if Grace and their other sister lived with Jill permanently or if they were shared between Jill and their dads. Stacey attended nearby Birch Hill Primary School where she was very bright and had a lot of friends. She was described as energetic, always having a smile on her face, always having a grin on her face. She was always laughing, having fun and she was just a normal, lovely girl. She did have what many would consider a bit of an unstable home life. The flat that she lived in was often used as a place where people, predominantly men, would come and go they would come to the flat to hang out and take drugs mainly smoking cannabis I believe and this was a regular thing this happened often. Stacey didn't have a great relationship with her mother. Jill really struggled with motherhood. She really struggled with her children. Stacey would push and push and push Jill and see how far she could get winding her mother up before her mother eventually snapped and would smack her. This was almost like a game for Stacey and Jill she would do it she would snap and she would smack and she would physically punish her children she would throw Stacy around the room she would uncontrollably shake her and Jill's ex-husband would later come out and recall a time when Stacy was screaming for no apparent reason and she had disturbed baby Grace and in order to shut Grace up Jill had lifted her up by the back of her dungarees and slammed her back into her cot Remember at the start I said that Jill had told police that she believed Stacey had run away just because she wanted attention. I think that that is why Stacey was a tinker, that's why she was naughty for her mum. She craved the attention from her and Jill had had a couple of boyfriends, she had other kids, she had friends around the flat almost all of the time so maybe Stacey wasn't getting the attention that she craved from her mother and she thought that by being naughty she would get the attention even if it was negative attention. That is just something that I thought that I kind of picked up on and I think it would make sense for a seven-year-old. Around 60 or so officers worked on Stacey's case carrying out a manhunt for her killer. They conducted door-to-door -door inquiries going to over 600 houses, they spoke to over 3,000 people, they tried tracking down people who were in and around the area of South Hill Park on that night to see if maybe they knew anything 
but it would be three weeks after the murder of Stacey that police would make their first arrest, arresting Stacey's one mother, Gillian Querapel, on suspicion of murder. Jill's arrest came following a few things. So on the night of Stacey's murder, the 24th of January, Jill had some unnamed friends over at the flat and I believe that Steve Hartigan was there too. Jill told these friends that she had sent Stacey to bed early after their argument and that two and a half year old Grace was also in bed so she was going to go and run a bath while the kids were sleeping. The unnamed friends had told police that around half an hour after this, so at around 6pm, they were roused by Jill. I don't know what they mean by roused, if they were asleep or if they were passed out drunk or high. Again, the flat would often be used for people to come and smoke cannabis. So they were roused by Jill who was telling them that Stacey was missing she had told them that she'd gone to run a bath she went to check on Stacy and Grace and she found that Stacy's bed was empty apart from her teddy bear however they all noticed something Jill hasn't been in the bath yet but she's wearing a completely different set of clothes and her shoes are all muddy now remember where Stacy was found was described as muddy and clardy and that Dr. Shepard believed that Stacy had been killed elsewhere and that her body had been left in South Hill Park, which again is five to 10 minutes away. Jill's shoes were examined and the soil that was extracted from her shoes, I believe perfectly matched the soil where Stacy was found. I do wanna note though that they live really, really close to South Hill Park. So it's not outlandish to think that Jill had probably probably has walked through there at some point recently and that this could have been old soil from then but it was something to note. Jill was staying with family when she was arrested and by all accounts I believe that she really appeared to be grieving the loss of our daughter. She was acting how any other mother would if their child had been murdered. She wasn't raising any suspicions or raising any eyebrows with her behaviour after Stacey's murder. So she's picked up in an unmarked car. This is because the media were going a little bit crazy at this moment in time and she's drove to the nearby Bracknell police station. While here, she was questioned for 87 hours across several days. 87 hours that is such a long time to be questioned they had to request a time extension twice in order to question her for this long but god 87 hours that is a long time throughout this she completely denied any involvement with her daughter's murder whatsoever she relayed her story onto the police that she had sent stacy to bed she'd run a bath she went to check on stacy and grace before she got into the bath that's when she found that stacy was missing she went and roused the company that she had over at the flat she then tried to look for stacy herself around about an hour to no avail and that's when she eventually called police over an hour later. She didn't shift from this story. She was very consistent when relaying it and when it was questioned and she even remembered like little details. Jill was eventually released without charge. There simply wasn't enough evidence to charge her. She would actually be arrested for a second time. I think that police really zoned in on Jill and they sort of got tunnel vision. Um, but yeah, she was arrested a second time but again was released. Following her release, Jill released a public statement which was read through her boyfriend Steve Hartigan where he said, quote, Jill is still very distressed but wants to make it clear the police were excellent in the way they handled everything during her arrest. She does not blame the police for their actions and is not bitter but is very concerned that Stacey's killer is caught. We find it unusual Jill was arrested for general questioning. Jill's close friends are being very supportive. Considering she is coping very well, but she is very dazed. She does not care about rumours, what people are saying about her or what they think. She just wants the killer caught. She does not intend to appear publicly to make any further appeal unless the police think it will help their inquiry. A formal inquest slash hearing into Stacey's murder began where the Crown Prosecution Services would review the evidence given to them by detectives, they would listen to people giving statements, sort of that thing, and then they would review all of this and either allow or disprove a trial going ahead. 
I believe from what I could gather that this is very much like a mini trial however I could be wrong because there was such minute information about this. During this Jill's ex-husband a man named Barry Querapel spoke about Jill and her violent tendencies and the abuse that she inflicted upon her children. He told the CPS Crown Prosecution Services quote Jill told me that she got a hold of Stacy by the neck and held her until she turned blue, until she realised what she was doing. This was a separate occasion from Stacy's murder, so this wasn't the night of Stacy's murder. Jill had done this a separate time. He went on to say how Jill had openly admitted to him before about how she had given Stacy a good shaking and that how Jill had actually attacked him once before as well. After they had separated, he went back to their house to collect some of his old bits, some of his old clothes, you know, stuff like that. And when he went to do so, she came at him with an iron bar. During this, it was also brought to light that Jill had made an extremely inappropriate comment to her sister Denise. So one day, her and Denise were sat and they were talking about Stacey and they were trying to come up with their own suspects, figure out who could be responsible, who could have hurt Stacey, who could have murdered her. And that's when Jill looked her sister in the eye and said, quote, it could have been me, and then started to laugh. How inappropriate is that? They are literally talking about the murder of her daughter and she's given it, oh, well, it could have been me and she's laughing. On what world is that appropriate? Especially when at this moment in time, the spotlight was very much on her. Denise said that when Jill said this, she just turned cold and a shiver ran down her spine and she said, quote, it was almost as though for a split second, Jill was a different person. I was panicking. The CPS listened to these and many more statements. They reviewed all of the evidence that was given to them by detectives. And based off of all of this, they decided to not go ahead with prosecuting Jill. They believed that there simply wasn't enough evidence to secure a prosecution. And of course, because of the double jeopardy law, they only really get one shot. They released a statement regarding their decision saying, quote, the reason is straightforward. On the evidence currently available, there is no realistic prospect of a conviction. That is the first ground we have to consider. And when I tell you that police were not happy with this, they were absolutely fuming. They firmly believed that they had their killer and that the CPS were blocking them from getting justice for Stacey. They weren't allowed to comment on this at the time. However, a close source did come out and say, quote, the CPS has decided to act as its own judge and jury. Everyone involved in Hunt and Stacey's killer is bitterly disappointed. Stacey's biological dad, Steve Norton, not Steve Hartigan, who I've already spoke about, Steve Norton, has said that in his heart, he knows who's killed his daughter. He knows who is responsible for her murder, but he just doesn't have the power or the funds to privately prosecute. The reason I've not brought Steve up yet is because prior to Stacey's murder, there was literally nothing to find about him. And afterwards, is not really a big amount neither. I'm assuming that based off of their upcoming actions that Steve and Jill do not get along at all. I don't know if they always had bad blood or if this only came after Steve was insinuating that he believed that Jill had killed their daughter. I don't know but based off their upcoming actions you can tell that they do not like each other. On the 2nd of July 1993, seven-year-old Stacey Querapel's funeral was held at East Hampstead Crematorium where she was buried. This was approximately five months after our murder. During the 25-minute service, hymns that were recorded from her fellow pupils were played and a poem that was written by Jill was read out by the Reverend and it read in part, quote, Do not close your heart to how you feel. Dream and don't be afraid, your dreams aren't real. Close your eyes, pretend it's just the two of us again. I wish I could find words to say how much I miss you, now you're gone. Throughout the 25 minute service, Jill was hysterical. She broke down almost completely throughout the whole service and she was constantly being consoled by friends. She was, as expected, absolutely devastated. At the end of the service, when it was time to lay Stacey to rest, Steve Norton was cruelly forced by Jill to stand away from the graveside as Stacey was lowered into the ground. He was only allowed to approach the grave after Jill 
and her family and friends had left. Jill and Steve Hartigan were moved from the Ladybank flat to a safe house in the Harmons Water area because Jill was receiving so much hate and death threats. There was a serious concern for her safety, which I can imagine if she is totally innocent of everything would have been traumatising for her. Imagine your child being murdered, you then being accused of murdering your child, being intensely interrogated, being outed and named by the news and now having death threats made on your life I can imagine that that would have been horrific for her. The two locations aren't massively far away so it's not surprising to discover that someone had found out where Jill was living. In the early hours of the 25th of August just over seven months after Stacey's murder Steve is awoken at around 1 30 a.m to find that the house that they're living in is completely engulfed in flames. Someone had poured petrol through the letterbox and set the house on fire trying to kill Jill and I don't think police even found who was responsible for this. There were other incidences of people doing mean stuff, nasty stuff to Jill. She would have her tyres slashed, she would often have her windows put out and you know for a long time because of all of this Jill was living in a nightmare. She was in fear constantly. With no new leads and no new evidence being discovered, Stacey's case sadly began to go cold and I don't believe police made any other arrests in connection with Stacey's murder. Tragedy sadly struck the family again when in 1999, Barry Querapel, who again was Jill's ex-husband, he was the man who spoke up about her child abuse, he would be killed by his own brother, Andrew Querapel. The two men were together in the local social club when they started arguing and Andrew pulled out a knife and stabbed Barry, which resulted in him dying. Andrew would be convicted of manslaughter because of this. And this is basically where Stacey's case has been sat. It was briefly reopened in 2004. However, that led to no new leads or arrests or anything like that. In 2018, Stacey's siblings spoke out anonymously expressing that they wanted their sister's case to be reopened because of the advance that we have in technology and forensics now. Steve Norton, who again is Stacey's dad, spoke out and said that he will never give up hope that Stacey's killer is found and that justice can be done for Stacey. Someone somewhere does know. I've always believed it. I've whether they're afraid, whether it's loyalty, whether it's, it just takes a phone call. You know, stay anonymous. You don't have to give your name. You don't have to just give the police that vital piece that they need. And that's, that's what I want. And I think that it's amazing that Stacey's family are being her voice, they're not letting her be forgotten, they're still fighting and they're still holding out hope. Even though her case is a little bit older, many other older cases are being solved because of advances that we have in technology. For example, Colette Aram, Geraldine Polk, Melanie Road, their cases were all over a decade old before they were amazingly solved and their families got justice. While researching, I did try to find if Jill has spoke out recently, but I couldn't find anything. The last time I saw that she had spoken out recently was when I told us earlier on when she released that statement after she was arrested, when Steve Hartigan read it out on her behalf. After that, I couldn't find another time when Jill has spoke out on behalf of her daughter or advocated for her case to be reopened or looked into, nothing like that. If it's out there, I couldn't find it. So before we wrap up today, I am going to take you through some theories that I came across while I was researching. While reading through them, I've got to say like 70 to 80 percent all believe that Jill was responsible or at least had some sort of involvement in Stacey's murder. Before we get into the theories though, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention the pathologist who conducted Stacey's first postmortem, the man who said that she had died from asphyxia and that her death was an accident, he doesn't believe that Jill murdered Stacey or at least didn't murder her deliberately. He has came out and said, quote, what parents at some time has not been driven to distraction with children playing up? There can't be a mother in the country who at some stage has not screamed at her children. As a single parent, life can't be easy. 
Mrs. Querapel is quite adamant in her memory of what happened and to say that she deliberately went out and killed her daughter is beyond belief. And I just wanna stress that everything I'm about to say is theory only, none of this is being proven as 100% fact. It is purely theory. I do go into fact a little bit later, but you'll know when I'm talking about fact. But what I'm about to say now is theories only. So the main theory was that after their argument on the 24th of January, Jill was overcome with fury, with rage and with anger that she completely snapped and started to choke Stacey with her necklace. We know from Barry that she had choked Stacey at least once before, but she was able to stop herself from what she was doing when she realised what she was doing and when she saw that Stacey was starting to turn blue. However, what if on this day she either didn't want to stop or couldn't stop. She then lied to her friends when they arrived at the flat. She told them that Stacy was asleep in bed when in fact she was already dead. She waited until her friends had either passed out, drunk or high or fell asleep and then she used the rouse of running about to give her time to dispose of Stacy's body in nearby South Hill Park. If this theory is true, I do believe that Stacy was likely killed before the friends even got to the flat because I can imagine if Stacy is being strangled to death by a mom in this very small two bedroomed flat that someone in the other room would be able to hear the commotion. I highly, highly doubt that Stacy was just stood there allowing it to happen. Unless it could have happened if Stacy was lay in bed because remember she didn't have any defensive wounds You would think she would even try to fight back a little bit So what if she was caught off guard? What if she didn't know it was coming? I don't know I've just thought of that could Stacy have actually been asleep and then Jill had just done it out of nowhere but that wouldn't line up with Jill just snapping because if Stacy is asleep in bed She's not doing anything to provoke her mom. I don't know Kind of going off the back of that theory, some people believe that it's possible that one of the unnamed friends that night could have been responsible for murdering Stacey. Again, that flat was used as somewhere where people would go to chill and take drugs. So maybe Stacey could have been in the way, someone could have been too paranoid or someone could have been too off their face and murdered Stacey. In this theory, Jill's only involvement is that she aided in hiding her daughter's body. In both of these theories, it does line up with Jill having muddy shoes and with Dr. Shepard saying that he believed that Stacey was murdered elsewhere and then was put in South Hill Park after. But something I haven't mentioned yet, something that I keep coming back to and something that just niggles in the back of my mind every time I think about what could have happened on this case, which I shouldn't really, I shouldn't get hung up on it, but I do because it was only mentioned in one or two reports. But someone actually reported seeing Stacey alone in South Hill Park on that night. So if she was alone in South Hill Park on that night, she couldn't have been murdered in the flat where Jill and her friends were. So if you believe that, then you've got to believe that Stacey did in fact sneak out of the flat after she was sent to bed by Jill. But I don't know, I come back to that as well because the flat was described as small. So I just think like surely someone would have noticed Stacey sneaking out or surely Jill would have heard that if she had to walk past the bathroom or through the sitting room, through the kitchen, anything like that. I did really, really try my hardest to find floor layouts of the flat so that we could kind of get a bit more context we could understand the layout better but I couldn't because I couldn't figure out what number they lived in. At the time South Hill Park was used by a lot of homeless people for somewhere to live. A lot of people would also go out to South Hill Park to use drugs. Like I mentioned earlier it's a very tree -y, tree area. There's lots of trees there which provides lots of cover and concealment so they can happily sit and use drugs without the fear of getting caught by police. So could one of these people have attacked and murdered Stacey if she was out by herself on that night? If that's true though, what's the motive? Because she wasn't raped or sexually assaulted. She wasn't beaten. She had nothing that they could have stolen or taken from her. So this would have been a crime of opportunity, a motiveless crime. Why would a complete stranger want to attack a seven-year-old girl who was just out playing? And the final theory that I'm going to talk about could potentially be a credible one. In April 2023, a 77-year-old man named Robert Fred pled guilty to kidnap and indecent assault after DNA evidence linked him to the sexual assault of a three-year-old girl. 
in 1986 when he was 40 years old Robert Fred was out driving in his van when he noticed a group of young girls playing together. He got out of the van and approached these young girls and told them that he was having some trouble with his car so could one of them please help him. He's going up to a group of like three and four year olds asking this. Almost all of the girls in that group said no, however one girl who has been referred to as Melissa said that she wanted to help so she went with Robert to see if she could help him with his car troubles. He is 40 and she is 3. He lured her into his van where he went on to sexually assault her. He then dropped her off at a random corner shop and gave her some money to go and buy some sweets. As I mentioned, it was DNA evidence that finally caught up to Robert and led to his arrest. Since his arrest, many other brave women have come forward and reported that they too were assaulted by this horrible man when they were children. So this predator was out in Bracknell in 1986 and he wasn't caught until very, very recently. So it's not outlandish or out the realms of belief to think that he could have been there in 1993 when seven-year-old Stacey Quirapel was murdered. Could he have been involved somehow? The only reason that makes me think maybe not is because again Stacey wasn't sexually assaulted and she had no defence wounds which you would think if a fully grown man who was a stranger was attacking Stacey she would try to fight him off. However I did think that it was interesting that he was in the area potentially at the time that Stacey was murdered. I definitely thought that it was worth mentioning. And that is today's case. Seven-year-old Stacey Quirapel was murdered almost 31 years ago and her killer is still out there. If you have any information that you think is of value to this investigation, please contact the police. You can do so by emailing helpstacey at thamesvalley.police.uk. You can also anonymously contact Crime Stoppers or you can drop into a local police station and quote the reference 650 open bracket 23 slash 1 close bracket. I will leave all of this information in the description box below. Make sure you comment down below and let me know what you think about today's case. What do you think about the theories? Was Jill involved? Was it an accident? Was it an outsider? Was it a stranger? Was it a friend? Who do you think killed Stacey? I really hope that Stacey's family one day get the answer that they deserve, that they need for closure. 31 is such a long time to have the question hanging over your head of who, what and why. Thank you all so much for sitting and listening with me today. If you have enjoyed today's video and you would like to watch another true crime case covered by me, I have plenty on my channel that are available for you to all go and watch right now. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe and click the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload a brand new true crime case. I also cover true crime in short form over on my TikTok account. You can find the link for that in the description box below. In the description box I also have a Google Docs link if you have any case requests that you would like me to cover on my YouTube channel make sure you fill out that form and I will take all of your suggestions and requests into consideration. So yeah I'm gonna leave today's case at that. Thank you all so much again for sitting and listening with me and always supporting me. I appreciate it so so much and I will see you all on my next one.